Hey, Math 20-2s. Today we're going to look at analyzing some puzzles and games. Let's do a quick investigation. Chris, a computer programmer, is designing a digital arcade app for the iPad. The game will have 10 levels of difficulty, with the first level being the easiest. At the first level, the object of the game is to drop the ball so that it lands at a predetermined exit marked by one of the letters at the bottom of the screen. An illustration of the draft of the first level shown. Determine how many ways there are to get to each black dot. Write the numbers over each black dot on the illustration. So how many ways can we get to this black dot? There's only one way here. And the path to this black dot is only one way. You only go that way here, and you only go to the right to get there. In fact, continually going down, there's only one way to continually go down. But how do I get to this middle dot here? How do I get to that middle black dot? Well, there's one way from here and one way from here. So there's two ways to get to that black dot. And if there's one way to get here and two ways to get here, well, I think there's three ways to get to that black dot. All right. So we've done part A. Part B, explain a pattern that may be developing. Well, based on what I've seen there, it looks like if I add the two black dots above... I should get the next black dot. All right. So explain this pattern. Sum the two black dots that lead to the next black dot. Did I use inductive or deductive reason to find this pattern? Well, I would say I used inductive because I'm doing examples, right? This is called inductive reasoning. I tried a few uh, spots up there, tried a few examples. Part C says, use your strategy in B to determine how many ways there are for the ball to reach each letter. A through G. So let's continue this strategy and see what we get down at the bottom. So two ways here, one way there, two plus one is three. How do we get to the outside? Well, there's only one way to get to the outside. It's got to continually go down this way. There's only one way. So I can make ones all the way down the outside. There's only one way to get to A. And there's only ones all the way down here. So there's only one way to get to G. Once I've got those outsides figured, then I can just go ahead and add, right? 1 plus 3 gives me 4 here. 3 plus 3 is 6. 3 plus 1 is 4. To each of those spots, let's go down to the next row. Uh, 1 plus 4 gives me 5 to there. 4 and 6 makes it 10. 6 and 4 makes it 10. And 4 and 1 makes 5 to that one. And finally, let's get to A. Well, there's only one way to get to A. 1 and 5 give me 6 ways to B. 5 and 10 give 15 paths to C. 10 and 10 is 20 ways to D. 10 plus 5 is, sorry, 10 plus 5 is 15 ways to E. And 5 plus 1 is 6 ways to F. There's still only one way to G. Great. Let's look at part D then. Refer back to lesson 1 of this unit, assignment question 2 on page 68. How does your expression, explanation of the pattern you determined in B compared to that of question two? Hmm, page 68 on question two. If you go back to page 68 and look at that, um, you'd see that both explanations are very similar, or they might even be the same. So we could say that this pinball game is an example of Pascal's triangle. Excellent. All right. Let's go to the next page and talk a little bit about game theory. 
The investigation in the previous page uses Pascal's triangle to develop the first level of the digital arcade app. In mathematics, game theory is a study of mathematical models of strategic situations or games in which a player's success in making choices depends on the choices of the other players. Game theory has many applications in economics and in social sciences. Game theory became a unique field of its own in 1928 when John Van Neumann published the paper, although this topic was discussed well, well before that. So let's investigate inductive and deductive reasoning in games and puzzles. NIM is a game of strategy played with two players. Two players take turns removing blocks or other objects from separate piles. On each turn, a player must remove at least one object from only one pile. Players may remove as many, as, as many objects as they wish, so long as all objects come from the same pile on that turn. The game may be played in two ways. One, the player takes the last object loses, or the player takes the last object wins. Many variants of NIM have been played since its origin in ancient times. Uh, Wynn and Henry play this simple variation of NIM to see if a winning strategy can be discovered. They set up one pile of pennies, and each player must remove one or two pennies only from the pile, alternating turns. The player to remove the last penny is the winner. So, a couple rules. They can remove only one or two pennies. Whoever removes the last penny, whoever removes the last penny is the winner. So you're going to say, wins the player one, and Henry is player two. They begin with one penny in the pile and start the game over by adding another penny each game until they reach six pennies. Play the game several times with a partner and see who wins. All right. So give this a try. Get a partner. Try and conclude page the questions about this, uh, this game with a friend. See what you come up with, and then uh, you can restart this and see where we end up. All right. So after playing it for a while, you should read part B. If you play the game with four coins, can you take? Can you come up with a strategy for player one to win every time? Sure. If player one takes only one penny, that leaves three. And starting with three pennies, player two um, has to win, or player two has to take uh, one or two, leaving you player one the chance to finish off picking up one or two pennies. So complete the table as such. That's how it should look. All right. Here are the reasons for the players winning. All right, starting with one penny, player one wins because he takes a penny and wins. With two pennies, player one wins because he takes both pennies and wins. All right. With three pennies, player two wins because no matter how many player one takes, one or two pennies are left over for player two to pick up at the end. Starting with four pennies, player one wins so long as he takes one penny and leaves player two with three pennies to take from. Then you get the three penny scenario, so player one will always win. Starting with five pennies, player one wins so long as player one takes two pennies and leaves player two with three pennies to choose from. Again, you get the player, uh, the three penny scenario. Therefore, player one should win. Starting with six pennies, player two wins no matter what because player one, whether he takes one or two pennies, is going to get back to a scenario where that other player is going to win every time. All right. So let's look at D. It's player one's turn. What is the smallest number of coins that can be left by Henry so that Henry knows that he will win? All right. So in order for Henry to win, the smallest number of coins left in the pile should be three. All right. Nguyen can't take all three. He has to take one or two, leaving Harry with one or two to win the game. Again, it's Nguyen's turn. What is the smallest number of coins that can be left by Henry so that Henry knows he will win? Second smallest number. The second smallest number, well, multiple of three, so we're going to go to six. Nguyen and Henry realize that a winning strategy may involve a link between the number of pennies in the pile and the number of pennies the first person removes. Play the game several times with seven pennies and devise a strategy to ensure that player one always wins. All right, in order for player one to always win with seven pennies, player one should only take a 
one penny. And that'll leave six pennies left. Leaving a pile of six for player two to choose from. Ensuring players one player one success. Repeat this for eight, nine, ten, and eleven pennies to complete the table. So where you go, pause it, try it, see what you come up with, then you can start it again and get the correct answers. So you should have tried it with 8, 9, 10, and 11 pennies, and we should complete the table below. So we said with 6 pennies, player 1 takes 1 or 2 pennies. Doesn't matter. Player 2 is always going to win with 6 pennies. With 7 pennies, we just said player 1 should take 1 penny, leaving player 2 with 6 to choose. Therefore, player 1 is going to win. With 8 pennies, player 1 should take 2 pennies, leaving player 2 with 6, guaranteeing player 1 success. With nine pennies, player one can't win. Whether he takes one or two, if player two knows how to play it, he's going to win every time. Ten pennies, player one takes one, leaving player one with um, nine and guaranteeing his success. Eleven pennies, he takes two, leaving nine pennies. And when there's twelve pennies, the first guy can't win. If player two knows what he's doing. So... Which player, first or second, has control of the outcome of the game if the original number of coins in the pile is given? Well, the key, if you look at this pattern, let's look at some patterns here. Player one wins. He's first to choose. Right? Number of pennies player one takes to start. Uh, he wins in these situations. He loses in that situation. Wins here, loses there. Wins here, loses at 9. Wins at 11 and 12. Loses, sorry, wins at 10, 11, loses at 12. So what numbers does the first player lose at? 3, 6, 9, and 12. So multiples of 3 seem to be an important part of this game. So player two wins when it's a multiple of three. Player one wins any other time, right? So which player, first or second, has control of the outcome of the game if the original number of coins in the pile is 12? If it's 12, player two wins. 12 is a multiple of three. Right. So having said that, you should be able to answer the rest of these. I've done part one. You should be able to answer parts two, three, and four. We figured out the pattern. 25 is not a multiple of three, so player one should win. 50, is that a multiple of three? No, so player one should win. 300, definitely a multiple of three, so player two should win that one. All right. Example one then, Brianne asked Joanne to choose any four days, four numbers in the month of September that form a square, an example shown, 5, 6, 12, and 13. Those numbers form a square. Brianne told Joanne to tell her only the sum of the four numbers. Brianne then said that she could correctly tell Joanne the calendar days she had chosen. Joanne said the four numbers added up to 72. Brianne correctly guessed the numbers on the calendars are 14, 15, 21, and 22. Brianne used deductive reasoning to determine the numbers. Part of her reasoning is shown below. Let's complete her work. So Brianne let n equal the smallest number. Then what must the other three numbers be? Well, the next number should be n plus 1. And the next number, well, if the smallest number is n, and it's in a week, it's going to be n plus 7. And then the next number should be this one, add a week. So n plus 1 plus 7 is n plus 8. Okay. So now, figure out the sum of these numbers. 
So sum would be n, n add n plus 1. Add n plus 7, add n plus 8. And that's something we've got 1, 2, 3, 4 n's. We've got 1 plus 7 is 8, plus 8 is 16. And Joanne told her that the four numbers added up to 72. So that sum should be 72. So let's figure out what n is. 72 is equal to 4n plus 6. Solve minus, sorry, 4n plus 16. So if I minus 16 from both sides, I get 4n equals 56. Divide both sides by 4, and n equals 14. So she was correct. The four numbers are 14, 14 plus 1, 14 plus 7, and 14 plus 8. All right. Very nice. Okay, try the questions you've been assigned. There you go.